Lindsey Graham is taking heat from fellow Republicans. The senator has, senator has proposed a federal bill banning abortion after 15 weeks. The bill is dividing Republicans who believe states should decide the issue. Graham contends that abortion is not a state's right issue, but a human rights issue. CBN's Matt Gulka spoke with Senator Graham at the Capitol. Senator Lindsey Graham's 15-week abortion ban legislation caught some on Capitol Hill by surprise and even caused some Republicans to slowly back away from the idea of federal abortion legislation. Still, the senator hopes that the issue unites Republicans in the lead-up to November's midterms. Graham's proposal is one of the most significant pieces of legislation Republicans have put forward since the decision overturning Roe v. Wade, making abortion a state issue. He maintains it still would be, even with a national 15-week ban on the procedure. Is that hypocritical, though? And what I mean by that is that for 50 years, we did hear from pro-life groups about it should be a state's choice. By taking away part of that choice, does that go against the argument we've heard for decades? I don't think so. I think uh, abortion is not a state right. A baby is not a state's rights issue. It's a human right issue. Democrats quickly pounced as they see abortion rights as a winning issue for them in November. The American people do not want politicians in their bedrooms and their doctor's offices. They do not want Lindsey Graham to make health care decisions for them. They want to make their own decisions. Graham's move also led to a split with some of his fellow Republicans. Well, I do believe it should be left to the states. That was a point of um, the Supreme Court decision. With regard to Senator Graham's bill, I think the fact of the matter is um, our Democratic colleagues don't believe in any restriction on abortion up until the time a baby is delivered. Uh, that's an extreme point of view, not shared by any civilized place on the planet. Um, and uh, I believe that that's, that's the contrast that he was trying to communicate. Graham feels his colleagues would ultimately vote with him if it ever came to that. I'm trying to say abortion on demand should stop then because the baby can feel pain. Science tells us when you poke the baby, it responds. Can you imagine what kind of death it would be to be dismembered by an abortionist? I'm trying to stop that. And you know what? If people are okay with abortion uh, up to the moment of birth, they can vote that way. I'm not okay with that. And I'm going to push back. And I think a lot of people listening to this program are glad that people are going to push back. If we don't stand up for the 15-week-old baby, who is? Pro-life groups celebrated the proposal, with some seeing it as an issue Republican candidates can use to take back control of Capitol Hill. I think that this legislation is really coming at an ideal time for uh, those who are running uh, for federal office, especially for the U.S. Senate, so that they can say, hey, this is a first step that we can all get behind. Senator Graham admits that he knows with the current makeup of the Senate, his bill likely would not get a floor vote, but he's confident that could change with a new Congress. At the Capitol, Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, I don't think there are the votes right now in the U.S. Senate to, to make a change. But here's the best news, and it's great news. The Supreme Court decided that Roe versus Wade was not based on constitutional grounds. That's been an argument from constitutional scholars since it was decided that Roe was wrongly decided. And it, it, it created a right that does not exist in the Constitution. You have to read it into the Constitution as opposed to it being there. Now what happens is you and I get to decide and we get to vote. It's a tough issue and we shouldn't turn away from it being a tough issue. And we need to let our voices be heard. And the best part of it, we get to vote on it and vote for our elected representatives and tell them how we feel and what we want them to do. That is a free democratic republic. That's what we are. And let's put it into practice. In other news, a railroad strike that could have crippled the economy has been averted. And that is some fantastic news. Ephraim Graham has that story and more from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim. Gordon, just hours before the deadline, the railroad companies and workers reached a deal. In an early morning statement, President Joe Biden thanked both sides for reaching a tentative agreement that will, quote, keep our critical rail system working and avoid disruption of our economy. About 60,000 workers were set to go on strike. The last sticking point was sick leave. 
just trying to get us some sick time to be able to take care of one ourselves and two our loved ones. You know, we 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 chose to be married and bring children to this world, and and that's what we're fighting for is to quality of life. A third of the nation's freight is moved by rail. A shutdown would have cost the economy an estimated two billion dollars a day backing up an already sluggish supply chain and putting greater strain on the trucking industry. With grain stuck in silos, the nation's food supply was also at risk, not to mention passenger rail, as Amtrak had already shut down some lines in fear of a strike. Social media giants are facing scrutiny over threats to national security. Major big tech representatives in the hot seat Wednesday taking questions from the Homeland Security Committee. The chairman accusing social media sites of intentionally sending users dangerous content that may fuel domestic terror. Unfortunately, because these platforms are designed to push the most engaging posts to more users, they end up amplifying extremist, dangerous, and radicalizing content. Former executives from Meta's Facebook as well as Twitter testified to the committee warning YouTube, Twitter, Meta and TikTok are not dealing with harmful material on their platforms and putting profits over safety. I lost my trust uh, with the companies uh, of what they were doing um, and what Meta was doing. Uh, I think we should move beyond trust to helping our researchers and journalists understand the platforms better. The former executives are also calling for transparency rules, but efforts to regulate social media have stalled in Congress. The social media platform Instagram responded to public pressure over a popular porn site. It recently removed the Pornhub account from its platform. This comes after an outcry from advocacy groups and victims of sexual exploitation. Those groups say it never should have been on the site in the first place. Now they're focusing on the Justice Department to do more to protect victims of the sex industry. Charlene Aaron is on this story. Prior to its removal, the Pornhub account had amassed more than 13 million followers. Critics say while the account did not share pornographic content on Instagram, as a whole, it facilitates child sexual abuse, sex trafficking, and the grooming of young children. They're applauding Instagram for finally shutting it down. They opened an investigation when our group started sending them evidence of criminality. They don't want to partner with known sex traffickers and hosts of child sexual abuse materials. Dawn Hawkins serves as CEO of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. In 2019, her group, along with activists and survivors, called on Instagram to remove the Pornhub account. The major reason, she says, was because of the material on child sexual abuse, sex trafficking, filmed rape, and non-consensual content. No mainstream corporate entity should be partnering with sex traffickers. Layla McElwaite, CEO of the Justice Defense Fund, recently tweeted, Instagram Meta made the right decision by cutting ties with Pornhub. Meta now joins Visa, MasterCard, Discover, PayPal, Grant Thornton, Heinz, Unilever, Roku, and many other companies in refusing to do business with Pornhub, a site infamous for monetizing the sex trafficking and criminal abuse of countless victims, including children. Hawkins says a major problem is that big tech companies are not forced to safeguard those spending time on their platforms. And as a result, we see that kids are exposed to explicit materials, as well as so much other harmful content. We need these companies to prioritize safety and health of all of their users. And that includes removing explicit material like this. The National Center for Sexual Exploitation maintains the Justice Department could do more simply by enforcing laws already on the books. These are the sites where anyone can upload content. It, it breaks numerous uh, federal, existing federal laws, including our federal obscenity laws, our child sexual abuse or child pornography laws, and our sex trafficking laws. And yet this, the Department of Justice has done nothing to go after these websites. While Hawkins and others praise Instagram's decision, they say the work of restoring victims is far from over. Many of them are just completely traumatized because the worst parts of their life have been have been filmed and recorded, and now they're being seen by hundreds, even sometimes millions of users who then download and reshare it. Charlene Aaron, CBN News.
Seems the law always trying to catch up to regulate technology. Gordon? Well, I applaud what Don Hawkins is doing, and she's being successful where other attorney generals have not been. And to actually get uh, Instagram to remove one of these sites is, uh, I, I just applaud what she's doing. This is really, really good. Uh, in, in my lifetime, Ed Meese tried to do it as the attorney general under uh, uh, Ronald Reagan. John Ashcroft went after child pornographers when he was the attorney general uh, in the Bush administration, and the Supreme Court said, well, unless you can absolutely prove that the individual in the video is underage and the well-funded porn industry was mounting a vigorous defense saying, well, what about fakes and, and all of that, and you, and you can't prove it, so you can't take us down, and we have free speech. It would be wonderful to see a Department of Justice say, well, let's try this again. Uh, maybe the Supreme Court will say protecting children is more important, uh, that the certain kinds of speech are not absolutely protected. You don't have a right to exploit people for profit. Uh, sex trafficking also exists in the, these online videos. Let us uh, try as a culture and a society to change it. Will it happen in this administration? I would love to see it. Uh, but I don't think it, they're, they're going to take it on, and, and it's primarily because the previous attorney generals have tried. But that doesn't mean you stop. Uh, let's protect the children involved here. Let's do whatever we can to help them. Well, if you're 28 years old, your organs are worth top dollar on the red market. That's the booming global trade for human body parts. Some people sell their organs for the money, Others have no choice. Dale Hurd brings us the disturbing details. Your body is valuable, certainly to you and to your creator. It also carries a street value in dollars and cents on the human organ market. Depending on your age, and the prime age is 28, the total can reach as much as a half a million dollars or more. Human organs are a hot commodity in today's world where people want to live longer and transplantation has become easier. The global market for human body parts is on the rise. Known as the red market, this lucrative underground economy is booming. Scott Carney is the author of The Red Market. Incredibly difficult to estimate how much is being spent on human materials. It's worth it, almost certainly in the billions, uh, and I would guess probably in the tens of billions. And it gets really, really tricky, though, because if you actually talk to a hospital in, say, America, they will say they never pay a dime for uh, a human organ. All organs are gifts, but they will charge a million dollars to implant an organ. So, they, they, so it's organ implanting services. Iran is the only nation where it's still legal to buy and sell human organs. Everywhere else, organs must be donated. But the black market organ harvesting business, especially in kidneys, is widespread in many developing nations where the poor are desperate for money. Here's a YouTube video from India explaining how to sell your kidney on the black market. It's still illegal in India, but the crimes are not prosecuted because of a HIPAA-like law that happens in India. And we use this idea of medical privacy over and over again, which it was for very good intentions, which is to protect um, the recipients and the donors. But that has also become a cover for criminals to operate in the shadows. In America, someone is added to a transplant waiting list every nine minutes, and 6,000 Americans died last year because of organs not donated in time. The demand in wealthy nations has created transplant tourism, traveling abroad to undergo a transplant. Healthcare in America is crazy expensive, and there are insurance plans that will tell you, hey, why don't you go do your dental appointments in Mexico? Hey, why don't you do your knee surgery in Thailand? At the same time, there are hospitals in other countries that will advertise that you can get an ethically sourced kidney um, very easily through their own programs. On the red market, buyers and sellers exist for every part of the human body. 
although kidneys are by far the most sought-after organ. The World Health Organization estimates that more than one kidney is traded illegally on the black market every hour. Officially, the United States does more legal organ transplants than any other nation in the world, more than 40,000 last year. Unofficially, the world leader by far is China, and experts believe almost none of the organs are donated but are stolen from political prisoners who were either executed or alive when their organs were harvested. Ethan Gutman, author of The Slaughter and one of the world's leading experts on China's organ harvesting program, says China may do as many as 100,000 organ transplants a year from executed or live prisoners, Uyghurs, Falun Gong, and Christians, many of them 28-year-old males. One of the reasons we know this is because they write up these cases. The, the doctors write up these cases and they brag about them in medical journals and so forth. And there's an amazing amount of 28-year-olds who suddenly just have heart failure. This is the age where your organs are very, very healthy and they're fully grown. But your overall health has not started to decline yet. And while an organ transplant in the West might be done hours after the organ is donated, Gutman says many Chinese transplants are recorded as happening the moment the organ is donated. Between when the organ is going from one person to other is often put at zero. This is not something you've ever heard of in the West, all right? Dr. Enver Todi has testified that as a Chinese surgeon, he was told to remove the organs from a man he realized was still alive and was struggling to escape but was too weak. Former Chinese prisoners have recounted how they thought they were getting health checkups, but were actually getting organ screenings. We all had a full checkup once a month. I had a scan three times, and they also did an X-ray to check my lungs every month. I even questioned them, why do you need to do an X-ray every month? But they said, you shut up, you cannot question us. China's organ transplant industry now attracts wealthy clients from all over the world. Catering to uh, Germans, Koreans, Japanese. It's very speculative when we get into the exact populations which are going there. We can just say a lot of people from the Gulf states are going. Legal organ transplants are still immensely important and offer the gift of life to those who might otherwise die. The illegal organ harvesting industry turns the human body into a parts bazaar. And China is making billions by turning the bodies of political prisoners into cash. Dale Hurd, CBN News. What a horrific story and what a horrific practice. Uh, and I hope it doesn't discourage you from being an uh, organ donor. You can be a life changer, um, life saving decision to say, yes, I, I want to, after my death, uh, allow someone else to live. The, the, that would be a wonderful thing. It's, a, it's horrible. It's turned into this kind of red market and underground trafficking and human organs. Uh, my hope is that medical science will pro progress to the stage where you can actually create your own organ using uh, stem cells, but uh, we seem to be far away from that. But that would be a wonderful future where this thing goes away and goes away permanently. Well, after her husband died, Christine Baker didn't have enough money to cover her mortgage, much less her other debts. She had no job, very little savings. Well, today, Christine has sold her home and bought another house with cash. She's also paid off all her debts, and here's how she did it. Christine Baker is living debt-free and loving it. This retiree will tell you she's found the key to financial well-being. It starts with being generous. It makes you feel good to give. I found it to be really fun and like, oh, why? Why don't more people do this? And I think it brings blessings to me. Like, I get peace of mind. Back in 2001, it was a different story. A military wife and mother, Christine was on her own after her husband of 32 years died. She had very little savings to live on, and military survivor benefits of $700 a month didn't cover the $1,500 mortgage payment. I thought I'd have to sell my house. I thought I'd have to move, so it was desperate. To make the situation even worse, there was other debt as well, and she didn't have a job. I prayed a lot, and I called 700 Club lots of times to have her prayer. Lord, we thank you, we praise you. And I had, just to have a little book, I'd write things down, answer the prayers, 
and um, it was just amazing how things worked out. She applied at a big box store and got a job as a food demonstrator. Once she started making money, there was something she wanted to do that wasn't done when her husband was alive. I knew tithing was the right thing to do. I saw my grandmother, amazing what my grandmother lived on, and my mother. My mother was really good at it, and the Lord just really blessed her. Immediately after she received her first paycheck, Christine tithed to her church. It wasn't easy at first. I had to lean on the Lord, and, and it, he just didn't let me down. She advanced at work. I'd get favor and blessing, and I did get raises. I did get raises because I did pretty well. It wasn't long before she found out her husband had a small life insurance policy which helped refinance the mortgage. Again, she saw God's faithfulness. He helped me. It's amazing how he helped me get through things. During this time, Christine was watching the 700 Club. They teach you about giving and about always giving first, give out of the first, and how you will, you give because you want to, not because you think you're gonna get something back, but you do get things back. As Christine increased her giving, she became a member of the 700 Club. So it was just a natural, they do such good things. I mean, I can't go and be a missionary, and, but I can help, I can help do that. I like the show because the way the gospel's delivered, yeah, I love the testimonies, the healings, people, you know, emotional healings, physical healings, um, delivered out of difficult situations. Yeah, I just love that part. You have the news, the world news, and how it relates. She sold her home and bought another with cash. Today, Christine lives debt free. She's done very well with her finances because she knows being generous is the key. I'm not rich, but I'm comfortable. And, um, you know, I don't take a lot of credit for it. It's, it's the Lord. Just imagine owning your home, being debt free, being able to buy a home with cash, no mortgage, all of these things. You look at Christine's life and that shouldn't have happened. Here she is, a widow, and uh, you know, where, where do I go? But she starts asking God. She calls our prayer line, she asks for prayer. Uh, God responds, answers her prayer, and she says, well, I know I need to start tithing. I'm going to start tithing. And you saw the increase. What shouldn't have happened, happened for her. And it can happen for you if you just follow the same principles. Here it is from 2 Corinthians. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each make up your own mind as to how much you should give. For God loves the person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Christine is walking that out. She is giving cheerfully. She's giving generously. And God, in turn, is providing for her generously so that she always has everything she needs and plenty left over to share with others. This isn't a get rich quick. This isn't, you know, you're going to start driving Cadillacs and have yachts and all that kind of stuff. No. God wants to provide for his children. He wants to provide your need and then plenty left over to help others. If you want to start a life of giving and giving generously and giving cheerfully, join the 700 Club. You can reach the whole world. You can reach the world with the gospel. A portion of every gift goes into the work of CBN International to do just that. We're preaching the gospel around the world. How? By training local Christians how to share testimonies of what Jesus is doing in their culture. Uh, not some faraway land. Uh, and then in their own language, they're hearing the gospel message and they're being invited to pray. Pray for healing, pray for deliverance, pray for salvation. You make it all possible when you join the 700 Club. So if you'd like to be a part, just call us, 1-800-700-7000. Now we have different club levels you can join. You can join at 700 Club, which is $20 a month. There's also 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $84 a month, and that adds up to $1,000 a year. And when you join the 700 Club, our gift to you 
is our latest teaching. It's on the one of the best loved passages in the Bible. It's the 23rd Psalm. Now, when you join at 700 Club, uh, we'll send you one copy of it. When you join at 700 Club Gold, we'll send you three copies. If you join at 1,000 Club or higher, we'll send you five copies of it so you have plenty of them to share with others so they can get this teaching on the 23rd Psalm. In it, we'll go verse by verse. You'll learn the Hebrew meaning behind the words, and you'll discover the promises, protection, and provision available to you. I want to do a meditation on the Psalm of David, Psalm 23. Gordon Robertson presents The Lord is My Shepherd, a Psalm of David. Each verse is a guide for us in our life. And it's a beautiful illustration for me of how Jesus leads us. What happens when we fully embrace the Lord is my shepherd? Get the Lord is my shepherd, the latest audio teaching from Gordon Robertson. Call now or go to CBN.com. Damaris is a single mother of five struggling to survive. She crushed stones and sold charcoal to make money, but there was never enough to feed her starving children. That's when Damaris did the unthinkable. She sent one of her children to buy poison. I wanted to be loved, so the first person that told me, I love you, I ran to him. I was 16 when I fell pregnant. Years later, Damaris left an abusive husband and did everything she could to care for her five children. I have done many different jobs. I headed cattle, crushed stones, and sold charcoal, but my children still spent many nights without food and we are not going to school. I could not afford their school fees. It was hard to keep us together. There were times I had to send them away to stay with anyone who could take one or two for a while. When she went to check on her children, she found them loitering in the street looking for something to eat. I asked God, why would you give me children for them to suffer this much? I could not take it any longer. I sent one of my children to a shop to buy poison. My plan was to first give it to them and then take it myself. What stopped me was my daughter, Jessica. She told me she could see I was not feeling well, but she thanked God and said she knew I would get better. I broke down in tears and decided not to go through it. At that moment, God gave me a reason to keep fighting because I saw my children had faith things would get better. Then a ministry supported by Orphan's Promise, Living Faith International, heard about Damaris and her children. We invited them to come stay at Living Faith and gave her a job as a caretaker in the home. Here, they are together and have everything they need. I am overjoyed seeing how my children have transformed. I am grateful that I get to work here and be with my children and spend time with them. We remember where God brought us from. When food is served here, we are very happy because we know what it's like to lack food. We also paid all of her children's school fees. I like my school uniform and love coming to school with my brothers and sister. We play together during break times. I love the merry-go-round because we go around and around, and it's so much fun. I have learned to read and write, and I feel so smart. I can count up to 50 and write my name. I also like playing with the blocks. Seeing them come home from school brings tears to my eyes. I appreciate the sacrifices you've made to help us. Thank you. I pray God will bless you so you can continue helping more children. Now, one of the issues in other countries around the world is that there are no safety nets for people. You know, sometimes you just get in a bind, you get in a place where you've made some choices and life has dealt you some cards that you can't figure out how to get out of where you're at and then add children to that. 
I think it's so amazing that we have the opportunity not just to help children thrive, but to keep families together, to bring hope to people who are wanting to raise their children, wanting to be with them. In this scenario, and it's not an unusual one, you allowed us to help Damaris find a job as well as a place to live, for her children to prosper as well, learning to read and to write, and who knows what God's plan and purpose for their lives might be. You know, we have that privilege. God allows us, invites us even into his plan for people who are hurting and in need. And we're, we're answering that call. We would love for you to join us. Join the 700 Club if you haven't done it already. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. We have lots of club levels. I know many of you are very tender-hearted toward people who are in need, and you're already 700 Club members. Would you consider going up to the 700 Club Gold level? That's $40 a month. Some of you can go up to the 1,000 Club level at $84 a month or become a 2,500 Club member at $209 a month. We have founders who join us at $5,000 a year. That works out to $417 a month. Ask God what he would have you to do. And then knowing that you get to participate in his very amazing plan to touch the world. Call with joy. There's our toll-free number on your screen. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. I want to be a part of making a difference. When you do, we want to send you something we think is going to be a huge blessing to you. Our way of saying thank you is to send you Gordon's latest teaching, The Lord is My Shepherd. I listened to this the other day and came away so special spiritually fed. I want you to have it too. I think you'll really be blessed by it. And by the way, when you call and join, if you do it using Pledge Express, that's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. You don't have to remember to do anything. It does save us some costs so we can affect even more lives like Damaris's and her children. Our way of thanking you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one every month and we think they will be another additional blessing to your walk with the Lord. Just want to say in advance, thank you so much for calling. Gordon? Well, when you join the 700 Club, you are preaching the gospel around the world in countries like Thailand. That's where a Buddhist girl named Peach learned about Jesus through CBN Superbook. Nine-year-old Peach lives with her parents and an older brother. Like most families in Thailand, they are Buddhist. When Peach's mom heard about an after-school program supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise, she encouraged Peach to go. That's where she saw CBN's Superbook for the first time. I saw the story of Jacob and Esau. I learned that God forgives sins and that we should also forgive each other. Just two weeks after Peach joined the after-school program, the country went into lockdown due to the pandemic. Peach's Sunday school teacher decided to keep meeting virtually. That's where they watched the episode about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was about to give Isaac to God as an offering, but God stopped him from killing his son. God loved them and had already prepared a ram as an offering. I learned that God loves us very, very much. Peach decided to pray with her teacher over the phone and became a Christian. I wanted to welcome Jesus into my life. I knew that he loved me a lot. I wanted to be part of his family. When the lockdowns ended, Peach invited her older brother to church, where he prayed to become a Christian. Next, her mom watched Superbook and prayed to become a Christian too. When Peach and her dad came down with COVID, they had to go to the hospital. Her mom and her brother had to go to an isolation center. Orphan's Promise brought food to them while they stayed at that center. I'm very grateful for the food packs you gave us. I was so worried, but because of your kindness and encouragement, I felt comforted. I knew that we were not alone. 10 days later, the whole family was reunited. That's when Peach said she prayed with her dad, and he became a Christian too. Thank you for telling us about Jesus. So now we could open our hearts to him. Now I follow him, and I'm ready to serve him. I'm so happy that my family knows Jesus. Thank you, Superbook, for our new life. And thank you for the new life that you've given that wonderful girl, her entire family, giving them hope, purpose, 
letting them know God loves them. God wants to provide for them. God wants to be their savior. He's already made the sacrifice for all of us for all time. It's amazing how people respond to the gospel when they get, when they get the good news. They go, yes, uh, I want that. I want that in my life. I want God in my life. You can be a part of it. How? Just join the 700 Club. It's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. If you're already a member of the 700 Club, I encourage you to go higher. Go into the 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. Uh, at whatever level, God is speaking to you to say, yes, let's do this. Let's get the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. Let's preach in their own language. Let's send these wonderful stories far and wide so the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's get this job done. Let's finish the Great Commission. If you want to be a part, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, yes, I want to join. When you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, the bank doing all the work. And we can send as our gift to you, Power for Life, monthly teaching CDs or downloads, streams, uh, your choice. Uh, when, you, when you join uh, on, the, on the phone, you have to ask for Pledge Express. When you join monthly on the internet, cbn.com, you automatically sign up. And then we have this new text to give where you can text the letters CBN to 71777. Uh, it'll send you to a monthly giving page when you give monthly uh, through that text to give. You're again, automatically signed up for Pledge Express. Ask for it when you call or go, go online to CBN.com. Now, when you become a CBN partner, we'll send you our newest CD, The Lord is My Shepherd. When you join at 700 Club Gold, we'll send you three copies. When you join at 1,000 Club, we'll send you five copies so you have plenty to share with your friends and family. This teaching will take you on a journey through the 23rd Psalm. You'll see how the Good Shepherd meets every one of our needs and you'll discover what it means to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Title IX is set to get an overhaul as the Biden administration redefines biological sex for students in federally funded schools and universities. The administration's plan is to combat discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. It recently opened up those changes to public comment which logged close to 350,000 responses. But more than half of those responses disappeared from the record this weekend. The Education Department is calling it a clerical error. The Supreme Court ruled a religious school in New York must, for the time being, recognize a gay rights group on campus. Yeshiva University petitioned the Supreme Court to stay a New York State trial court's ruling on the issue. Earlier this week, Justice Sonia Sotomayor granted a reprieve, but now the full court has ruled five to four the school should comply until it has exhausted other legal avenues for relief. Justice Sotomayor switched her vote, and she was joined by Chief Justice Roberts, as well as Justices Kagan, Kavanaugh, and Katanji Brown-Jackson. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's cbnnews.com. imagine trying to suffocate yourself or banging your head against the wall repeatedly? Kimberly Smithers can because that's what she did throughout her childhood. Kimberly was so angry with her abusive parents that she took out her rage on herself. I would always think about cutting myself or I would like get on the floor and smash my head on you know like the wall or on mostly the floor. Um, I try to suffocate myself. The memories and scars of her parents' verbal and physical abuse would haunt Kimberly Smithers for years. My bed was a cardboard box, and I remember just laying there, you know, like just angry and hurt, being, you know, abused, being hit, being, you know, talked down on, and it always bring me back to that place of like, oh wait, I'm not worthy. I was a mistake. When Kimberly was small, her parents split up and she lived alternatively with both before going into the foster care system. It wasn't until high school she found the love and affection she'd wanted, her first boyfriend, who got her pregnant at 15. 
I was so obsessed, you know, with him and because I really, really wanted like him to love me. I was looking so much for love and acceptance. They broke up and she moved on to the next boy and the next, still unable to find or accept anyone's love. I would find myself angry and like they're not loving me the way I'm supposed to be loved. So, you know, I'll get angry and I'll fight with them and I'll hit them and I'll throw things at them and, you know, I'll cuss them out and then I'll leave and then I would feel bad again. After aging out of foster care, Kimberly and her son moved in with her new boyfriend. Then she got pregnant again. I was the only one working. Um, you know, he was on drugs, always high. He's, you know, we were constantly like, arguing, fighting, like, we both just decided, like, okay, like, we can't have this baby. Like, we can't do it. So I went and had an abortion. When I had the abortion, though, that's when it really, really, like, it really made me, it made me feel, like, dead inside. You know, it really, like, I felt terrible. I was just really distraught, and that's when I started doing drugs with him. Over the next seven years, Kimberly had two more children, still using drugs and trying to keep her head above water, working low-wage jobs or on public assistance. One night, she was at a party when a rival gang came looking for a relative. There was a big fight. Everybody's fighting and two, two rival gangs. So my cousin and I started running. We went underneath the car. I don't know how they didn't see us go underneath that car. They parked right in front of the car we were under and they ran to the wall. They thought we jumped the wall. So they were like looking over the wall like, oh, do you see them? Like, And I was underneath the car begging God for my life. Like, I was like, please God, like, don't let them see us. Like, I don't want to die. They didn't see us. That close encounter with death caused Kimberly to examine her life. I started going to college, taking it more seriously. I was tired of being on drugs. I just started thinking, like, there has to be way more to life. One day, she and her boyfriend went to the library looking for self-help books, scanning through books on the supernatural and religion. She found one she couldn't ignore. It just intrigued me right away. I took the book, and I, as soon as I got home, I started reading it. At the time, Kimberly, now 26, didn't realize the book she'd chosen about renewing the mind was by a Christian author. As she read, something happened she couldn't explain. As I read it, I was like, this is like, because it talked about Jesus, so I was like, is this Jesus? And then I felt myself like not craving drugs, and I knew it was like gone. A former foster family had talked to Kimberly about Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but their faith never made sense to her until now. I started just crying, like, and I've seen the clouds like part. Like he was showing himself to me. I want to know this Jesus. Like I want to know God. Like I want to know him more. Kimberly surrendered her life to Christ and found a church. Before long, she was baptized. It felt so good. You know, like the drugs, nothing could compare to God's love. Nothing, nothing could compare. You know, being high, you know, being drunk, like everything, everything that the world has to offer, the guys, the lies, everything, not all, everything goes. Kimberly says with God's help, she eventually forgave her parents. She also met Christian at church and they were married. He adopted her three children and they're raising them together, teaching them about a loving God. I'm so overwhelmed with his love and compassion and his forgiveness. His forgiveness is beautiful like I didn't deserve the Lord you know to, to come back for me you know in reality he was always there like even as I look back in those hard times in those places the Lord was there and it's just beautiful that he loves us so much you know that he comes back and that he is constantly revealing himself to us it's beautiful because he doesn't have to you know he doesn't have to but he wants to because he loves us The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. That's what God's Word says. You know, when you're doing drugs or you're drinking or you're trying to do things that'll fill that emptiness inside of you, every day, every day, you're trying to do that. But God's love God's love envelops you. God's love pulls you away from things that damage you. God's love fills that emptiness inside of you. God's love lets you know that you were created, designed by him, if you will, with intention, 
with purpose, with value. You know, we often talk about the fact that when in childhood we're robbed of that because of family situations, because our parents didn't know it either and were treated badly, we develop an orphan spirit. You know, I'm not worthy. There's no one who loves me. Why am I empty all the time? Why do these bad things keep happening to me? And we start making choices that just keep us buried in the junk that's destroying us. But right there in the middle of that mess comes the Spirit of God, wooing us, calling to us, loving us. And that love reaches our hearts. And just as Kimberly said, something begins to change. Now today, if you're somebody who is stuck, you know, you've been looking for meaning, you've been looking for purpose. Listen, listen to the voice of God. He's calling to you right now, asking you to let him come into the middle of your mess, change your life, show you what you were created for. You can't get good enough to do this. He specializes in coming right into the mess. The scripture says that he reaches down and he pulls us up out of the muck and the mire and he sets our feet on a rock, the unchangeable rock of Jesus Christ. You can have that today. You don't have to earn it. In fact, you can't. There's nothing that you have to do except say, I'm yours, Jesus. I want you to come into my life. I want you to change me. I want you to teach me your ways because they're different than mine. I want you to heal the brokenness inside of me. The part that doesn't know who I am, that doesn't think I'm valued, that doesn't know you, that doesn't even understand why I'm here. Would you just, would you just come into the middle of me? Would you show me how to live for you? Change me, God. I'm a mess. And forgive me, please, for all the things I've done that have caused my life to be damaged, that have caused me to feel this way. I want to know you. Jesus, come into my heart now. Teach me, touch me, change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. It's that close. Jesus is a prayer away. He's right here. He's right now. He's for you. If you need to pray with someone today about a specific need in your life, I want you to know our prayer, our prayer counselors are here all the time. Our number's on your screen. It's 1-800-700-7000. You just call and, and say, would you pray with me? You don't even have to give your name if you don't want to. These people are here every day waiting for you to call, and it is their good pleasure to pray with you. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Don't miss out on it. It's free. It's yours for the asking, and it's eternal. So call now. Gordon? Well, we leave you today with the words of Jesus, one of my favorite scriptures from John chapter 7. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. From your innermost being, may he spring up and flow out of you today. God bless you. We'll see you again.